In the early summer of 2020, right in the middle of lockdown, me and my girlfriend, now wife, decided to pack up and leave New York City. I won't bore you with all the logistical, political, and financial reasons, but since she has family down in Texarkana, we figured that was a good place to stay as any. We got more bang for our buck down there than if we stayed up on the East Coast, and we figured if we missed New York after a year or so, we could always just move back once everything had blown over. We ended up finding this nice little rental house, one that was actually cheaper than what we were paying for our Manhattan apartment, and we had all of our stuff moved in by the end of June. Then one day, as we were coming back from grocery shopping, we happened to spot our neighbors from across the street. Since it was our first time seeing them, we figured that we'd go over and say hi, but as I got closer, I realized why we hadn't seen them around so much. The chick of the half-couple was heavily pregnant, and she greeted us with this big smile as we walked over to introduce ourselves. We made a little small talk. I specifically remember talking about barbecue recommendations with them and then we just sort of parted ways. A few weeks later, my girlfriend's mom came over to visit us with this sort of care package, but when she was leaving, we spotted the neighbors from across the street again. They just pulled into their driveway and the guy was helping his heavily pregnant wife out of their car, so we just said hey as we were walking my girl's mom to her car. Before she got into her car and drove off, we made plans to meet up for some dinner sometime. But while we were talking, my future mother-in-law kept shooting glances over at the pregnant couple. Call it your typical male ignorance, but I really didn't think anything of it at the time. Only later, my girl mentions how her mom had said something kind of weird. She did it in that sort of, I want to talk about it, but I don't feel comfortable initiating kind of way and we'd been dating that long that I knew that it was my job to sort of poke and prod until the whole story came out. I was kind of worried that it was something personal, so what came next was weirdly relieving, but I mean heavy emphasis on weird because, well, you'll see. My girl and her mom had been texting back and forth after she arrived back home in Paris, Texas, not French. When almost out of the blue, she'd said something to the effect of, your neighbor is faking her pregnancy. Right away, I'm thinking, how in the world could she possibly tell just from looking at her? But at the time, my future mother-in-law isn't crazy. In fact, she's incredibly level-headed and just about the best mother-in-law a guy could ask for. It's not like she'd just throw out an accusation like that out there without a good reason. And then there was the fact that my mother-in-law is a mother of five, with my girl being the youngest, so it made sense that a woman who'd spend half a decade making babies would know a thing or two about the whole process. But if that was the case, how could she have possibly been hiding it from her husband? Well, according to my mother-in-law, either the husband was as dumb as a rock, or he knew his wife was faking it. But still, the question remained, why would she fake a pregnancy like that? It's not like we could just walk across the street and ask her. And between us... Me and my girl were still in two separate perspectives about the whole thing. Then, besides all that, we'd have our answers in a matter of months, maybe weeks, because she looked ready to pop at any moment. We don't forget about the whole thing, and saying hey to them was definitely a little more awkward, but we were mostly occupied with settling into our new place, so the whole fake pregnancy thing was sort of drifting into the back of our minds. I mean, my girlfriend's mom might just be wrong. It would be slightly out of character for her, but it wasn't out of the question. It was kind of an insane thing to say. And then one day, we realized that we hadn't seen our neighbors for quite a while. We figured that if she really was pregnant, that we'd see all kinds of activity around the house at the time of the birth. But not only was there none of that whatsoever, but it was like the pregnant couple just sort of disappeared. This is what first clued us into the fact that something might be wrong and that my girlfriend's mom was actually right about such a wild accusation. We didn't hear anything about it though, not from our neighbors and not on the news either. And then eventually, me and my girlfriend decided to stay in Texas and we moved to Austin and later got married. And then, in September of last year, my wife sends me a link to a news website along with about six super shocked face emojis and the words, Look at the picture. I opened up the link and was greeted by the headline, Texas woman allegedly stabbed mom-to-be a hundred times, then tried to steal baby from womb. Then when I scrolled down, 
staring back at me as the mugshot of the heavily pregnant woman that we used to live across the street from. She was wearing that orange jumpsuit and looked like she'd been crying, and at first I thought she was the victim, but when the shoe finally dropped, I realized how the fake pregnancy had tied into what had happened. And let's just say that I know what it means to feel your blood actually run cold now. Last I heard, she's one of the only women on the Texas death row, and when you read through what she actually did, you realize that she legitimately deserves to be there. Our old neighbor had apparently faked the pregnancy to stop her boyfriend from leaving her, and then went about befriending an actual pregnant woman with the idea of stealing her baby. She got close to the murdered woman and her partner too. Like I hear that she actually went to the girl's wedding and all that stuff and it was all just some long con job with murder being the final step of the plan. That's the part that really stuck with me. And I know that sounds dumb considering how horrific the crime itself was, but it's the slow burn aspect of it that really gives me the chills. Someone being that close to you, faking the whole thing, coming to your wedding and taking pictures and whatnot, and all the while, they're just waiting until the time is right to stab you to death, cut open your womb, and steal your unborn child away. I, a 32-year-old female, used to have a job cleaning movie theaters in my early 20s. Because of how bad I needed the cash, I worked a string of crappy jobs around that time, but that one was the worst, and for a bunch of different reasons too. Firstly, people who go to the movie theaters are just disgusting. Okay, maybe not all of y'all, and if you're one of the good ones, I thank you from the bottom of my boobs. But oh my god, it's like people were legitimately out there thinking, what is the single most disgusting thing that I can leave in this dark theater? And they went ahead and just did it. I found full diapers, needles, nail clippings, and then there's the time someone puked into an empty bag of chips and then somehow partially sealed the bag again, meaning one of my coworkers just grabbed it up off the floor and ended up with puke all over their shoes. There was like a ton of other stuff that we found that would end up with this post getting a not safe for work tag, so I'll just get into my next point and leave y'all in suspense. There's a bunch of other stuff that I hated about working that job, but without a doubt, the worst thing was the lack of security. The shift started at 2 a.m. Yeah, 2 in the morning. So there was that part that made me hate it. But getting to and from whatever theater we were cleaning with no means of transport aside from a bicycle put me in a very vulnerable position. That and the venues we cleaned didn't hire anyone but lazy, overweight, or meek-looking security guards to keep us safe. On a slow weekday night, I decided to go out and pick up the trash in the parking lot. This was maybe 4.30 to 5 in the morning and the theater was also next to a super busy road so people passing by could see into the well-lit but deserted parking lot clear as day. I had headphones in, along with the grabby stick thing to pick up gross stuff, when I suddenly get a call from my boss who was inside the building. I click the little button on my headphones wire to answer the call, only to hear my boss on the other end with a kind of concerned tone in her voice. She tells me again with this anxious tint to her voice that some truck just pulled into the parking lot opposite to where I was. She thought the guy was acting a bit suspicious, so I was to finish what I was doing immediately and come back inside. No sooner that she says that, but what I assumed was the same truck pulls right next to me and stops so quick that the tires actually screech. It all happened so fast that I just kind of panicked and froze up, but when the van sliding door slid open and I saw a guy with a shirt wrapped around his face leap out in my direction, I dropped everything and ran. There was only a few feet between me and the door and I don't want to think about what would have happened if it had been any further away. Every single step that I took felt like it'd be my last before this shirt-faced guy took my legs out from under me and when I got to the door, grabbed the little shutter bar and turned to slam it closed, he was right there in front of me. He couldn't have been any more than a second or two from getting a good firm grip of the door frame, and as it stood, he did manage to get his fingers on it, but it just so happened to be right as I slammed the door shut. 
The how that he let out was satisfying on a primal level that I can barely put into words. Hurting a person that was trying to hurt me, it felt like the kind of instant karma that only comes around once in a lifetime. But as much as it felt great, we still weren't clear from danger and later on when the adrenaline high wore off, I was a complete nervous wreck. The cops were called, I gave a statement and at the end of my shift, everyone took cabs home instead of walking or biking or taking early morning buses. It was like we all know that it could have been any one of us out there. Maybe if it had been someone a little slower than me, things would have been a lot different towards the end of that shift. And I think because of that, it made all my coworkers all the more empathetic and although I didn't stay in that job for much longer after that, I still have a hell of a lot of affection for all the girls that I used to clean those theaters with. Maybe I'd have stayed a little longer if the theaters that we hopped between decided to beef up their nighttime security a little, but I think the most that we were ever promised was one extra overnight security guard and the placement of a few security cameras. That wasn't good enough for me though, and as I mentioned, I ended up quitting a few weeks after this incident. I felt very guilty for a while though because I was young and free enough to be able to quit if I wanted to, but most of my coworkers were not in that same position. They needed the money too bad to just up and leave a secure job like that, meaning they had no choice but to put themselves at risk night after night to take care of their families. And for that, as well as how well they took care of me following the most frightening incident in my whole life, I'll never ever forget them. I used to play a lot of Call of Duty. I mean, I loved the franchise, and I still do, but it was also like the only game my group of friends all played aside from playing FIFA or something. So if we wanted to all play something together, we played Call of Duty. We were all really into Modern Warfare 2, so as you can imagine, we were all very excited for the release of Modern Warfare 3. All of my chums at football were getting it, as we're all old mates from school, and I remember early November of 2011 being nothing but hype. The game dropped, it was awesome, and I think we all spent the next three days playing here and there before the weekend hit, by which point, nothing was stopping us from binging Team Deathmatch. That Friday night, I played from the moment I got home from work to about 1 o'clock in the morning, jumping in between parties as various groups came and went. Then, at about 1ish, I'm still trying to work my way up to a nuke when, in the middle of a match, I hear this, our UAV is online, and then, help me, in quick succession. But the help me part didn't seem like it was coming from the game at all. I remember grabbing my TV remote and hitting the mute button and then just sitting there in the dark and quiet of my flat's living room, feeling more and more anxious with each passing second. I didn't know if I was imagining things or if it had come from the game chat or something, but when half a minute or so went by and I didn't hear the voice again, I just went back to playing Call of Duty and assumed it was nothing. But then no more than a few minutes go by when I hear the same weak help me and that time, I was 100% sure that it wasn't coming from the game. Now just to clarify, I was talking with my friends via headphones, but all the game noises are coming out of the TV, and that's why I could even hear the voice in the first place and why it was so confusing at first. Now anyway, I whip my headphones off, mute the TV, and walk over to my flat's living room window to look outside. I can't see anything, and a good couple of seconds pass without any more noise, but I'm seriously on edge by that point because I can't see who's saying help me, but I know for a fact that I heard it without a shadow of a doubt. I'm not saying that I thought it was some ghost or anything, but because I can't see them, how long is it before someone walks into view with their head just hanging off or something? But then, I hear it a third time, slightly different though and clear as crystal. The voice sounded weak and desperate and so so sad and I could clearly hear someone just below my window say can you please help me and just so you can understand what I'm talking about you have to understand the layout of where I lived at the time I lived on the first floor so although I had a pretty good view of the pathway and the street outside 
I couldn't see what was directly below me, and that's where the voice was coming from. But the thing is, if there was someone standing below the window that I looked out of, I could usually see their head and their shoulders at least, like it wasn't a complete blind spot like that. So the fact that I couldn't see anything at all, that's what had me so freaked out to the point that I thought something paranormal might actually be occurring. And the fourth time I heard it, I swear I felt my soul leave my body with fear. It was so creepy. But once I got over myself and got it into my head that it wasn't a ghost, I realized someone needed help, and they needed it fast. So long story short, I run outside, and I see this poor old little old lady lying on the paving slabs under my window with a big bloody crack in her head. It's quite a sad story in the end. She had dementia and had gotten lost a few hours before. And then after wandering into our backyard, she apparently fell and became delirious with pain. We called the police and, thank God, she was taken to the hospital, confused but unharmed. I'm glad to have helped her that day. It felt nice to think that I've actually helped rescue her. But still, for a few minutes there, I honestly was properly touching cloth. In 2017, I had heard news of people dressing up as clowns and running around with knives at night. I typically brush those types of things off because I got my own problems. I, at the time, was a 20-year-old female and was often up at all hours of the night dealing with my screaming newborn. It was January or February, so we still had some snow and I wasn't able to get out of the house often. Taking out the trash, which was located right out the back door, was usually the most I got of fresh air. One morning I took out the trash and happened to glance over to the right and noticed footprints directly under the window to my baby's room. I walked over to inspect and not only were there footprints, but there was also hand indentations on the window screen. Weird, but baby slept in my room so not very concerned at the moment, but the boyfriend was losing his marbles. I fast forward a couple of days and I was up at around 3am and heard not exactly what I would call screaming, but more of a screeching howl. We have lots of stray cats, so I kind of thought that that's what it was and ignored it. Once the sun was up, I looked out the window and noticed a few sets of footprints that really didn't make sense because it kind of looked like someone had just been passing between the houses. But again, I blow it off because we had a drug house across the street and we've had people cross through our yard before to get to that house. Maybe four nights later at 3 a.m., I'm breastfeeding and hearing a dragging noise against the house, and from where I was sitting on my couch, I could see the back door. The back door has a window with blinds on it and doesn't seal well due to wood rot on the frame. I pause the TV and listen just to hear it again, now directly at the back door. Looking over, I can clearly see a looming figure just standing in the window, holding one of those big kitchen knives and... Granted, the blinds were shut, so I'm seeing the creepy shadow version of this. He runs the knife across the window panes before softly knocking. Meanwhile, I'm trying to figure out what to do with my newborn latched on because my phone is in the bedroom and something in me doesn't want whoever this is out of my vision. So I stand up and readjust because I really didn't want a screaming baby right then and walked into my kitchen and flick on the light and then said, just loud enough for him to hear me, Hey man, I already called the police and I'm sure you don't want to deal with them, so why don't you just go home? I don't know why I talked to him so calm and normal, like I don't think he was expecting anyone to say anything because he froze that moment I began talking. He talked it over with himself for a minute and just darted down toward the alleyway. Never had anything like that happen again, but... Boyfriend was incredibly mad that I didn't wake him up to handle the situation or at least actually call the police. Not sure if this counts as a creepy encounter, but I sure was creeped out once my sleep-deprived self realized what had just happened. This is going to be a pretty tame story compared to a lot of the great ones I've read here, but since it happened to me, I think it's pretty spooky. I'm writing this only a few hours after everything had happened, 
now that I've calmed down and the sun is coming up and I feel somewhat safer. Last night I was lying in bed reading a little before I went to sleep. I think it's important to clarify that I live on the outskirts of my town, still in town but definitely on the edge, off the highway that leads out of town and into about a 15 mile long stretch of lots of country. Woods, fields, a few residences, but mostly open highway. So other than the other tenants in my actual apartment building, it's normally very quiet in my area. My building is a square with four apartments, and for each of us our door simply faces out into the open. There's no lobby or a foyer or anything. My door is in particular looks out into a large field that goes up a hill. I don't remember the exact time, but sometime between 1 and 2 a.m., someone randomly started banging on my door, which freaks me out at the best of times in broad daylight, but especially in the middle of the night. I nervously went to ask who it was, and this guy with a deep voice claimed that he was a police officer and that I needed to let him in. That's what he said. I needed to let him in. Not that I needed to open the door. Luckily, I watch and listen to a lot of true crime stuff, so I got pretty suspicious really quick. I just got near instant alarm bells because he couldn't tell me why I needed to let him in, what I supposedly did, and he never asked me what my name was. He also didn't really sound like a cop, if you know what I mean. Obviously, I was feeling creeped out, so I called 911 to confirm that there was actually an officer at my address, and they said there wasn't. At this point, I'm freaking out and I kind of call out through the door that I'm on the phone with the police and the guy just kind of bangs on my door one more time and then stops making noise, I presume because he ran off at this point. They dispatched two cars to my apartment and the officer took a good look around. Unfortunately, the guy was long gone by the time they got there and I never saw him, so I don't have a description of him or anything, but the cops said two things to make me feel better. One, they'd post more patrols in my area over the Halloween weekend, and two, it was most likely a Halloween prank because the bar down the street from my apartment had had a party and it had just closed not too long before. Always trust your instincts, and remember that if you have any doubts about someone claiming to be a police officer, call 911 and confirm that they are who they say they are. Dispatch and the officers who came tonight told me that you will not get in trouble for making sure the person talking to you is actually an officer. This also applies to situations where it's nighttime and dark, so you can't really see for sure if it's a real cop car behind you or not. If you see flashing lights behind you on a back road or a dark area at night, put on your hazard lights and call 911 first to make sure that it's actually a police car. You won't get in trouble, and it's better safe than sorry. I've just recently discovered this subreddit and I have a story to share that has really traumatized me for quite a while now and I feel that this is a good place to share it. And it will be my first big reddit post. A lot, if not all of the posts that I've read here are American and Canadian so for context, it's important that I start that I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand. We do have the odd missing person case or scary case but it's otherwise safe here and not much happens. I mean that in a way that as a 19 year old girl I feel comfortable to walk the streets at night or go on hikes alone because it is pretty safe and everyone looks out for one another generally speaking. Now this happened in the summer of 2019. I will link a location so you can better understand and hopefully some photos if I can find them online. My boyfriend and I were headed out on a picnic date to a spot that we had visited before plenty of times. It's at the end of a very long, windy, rural farm road off of the state highway, so you drive for like 15 to 20 minutes from the main road down a long farm stretch, and at the end is a large cul-de-sac and a surrounding massive farm. The owners of the farm have left the land kind of open to the public as a reserve because there are native trees and other things, and because about a 15-minute walk from the cul-de-sac and car park, there is a small waterfall that you can swim in. The track is really popular as it's one of the closest swimming spots to the nearest city, Hamilton, and it's really scenic. You cross footbridges, you pass by creek beds, and all that good stuff. The farmers still go through every now and then and do their own farm work, and 
There are fenced off areas that the public can't enter as they still actively work the land. This particular day my boyfriend and I were super happy because it was empty in the parking lot and it was a super hot summer day so that was really rare. The farmer was crossing the cows through the gate on a quad as we arrived and he smiled and waved at us. He's an older man and we had spoke before as we were regular visitors. So we set off towards the waterfall. We crossed one footbridge and passed through a big paddock of cows. The track is quite narrow and the creek is right off the edges so you have to be careful. We saw the waterfall, decided against swimming as we had no towels and headed back towards the car park. Now on our way back we decided to go down a little bit of a steep gravel off ramp on the track that led to a more private tree covered area right by the creek. And here's where it starts. We were kissing and whatnot. I was lying on my tummy reading a book and my boyfriend was sitting up playing on his phone and he was rubbing my back and playing with my hair. We were there for about 10 minutes before I turned and glanced up the gravel path and way up even further on a hill through one of the farmer's gates. I see a man on a quad bike who I didn't recognize as one of the farmers as there was only an old couple who worked the land. He was just sitting there staring at my boyfriend and I and I don't even want to think about how long he had been there before we noticed. I told my boyfriend and as soon as the guy saw that we were both looking at him, he opened the gate and started heading down. Now both of us immediately got up to leave as we did not want to have a conversation with a farmer about us getting freaky on his land which is what we both assumed would happen but it was so much worse. The guy came down the gravel track and ran his quad right through the creek. He left it there running in the water and got off. He seemed to be talking to himself, saying things along the lines of, Oh, I've messed up my quad. Oh, I've destroyed the engine. Over and over before he even got near us. My boyfriend and I were gathering our things to leave at this point and he starts to head towards us. He didn't even make small talk, which was really strange because he just went straight into saying, have you guys seen any fish? I'm looking for some fish to kill. My boyfriend tells the guy that there's no fish in the creek as it's freshwater and he's probably best off to catch some eel and this sends him into a fit and he starts saying, I don't want an eel. I want to kill some fish. I had made it a point to not look the guy in the eyes as I didn't want to draw the conversation towards myself because I was already extremely freaked out and I didn't want him to notice that. My boyfriend is much more of the calm and strong one when it comes to stuff like this. But for a second, I did look at the guy and thought that he looked like his face was slightly deformed, possible Bell's palsy as I worked in aged care and I've seen it a bit and it looks similar. I bent down to tie my shoe up and when I was standing back up, that's when I saw a pistol on this man's waist. Listen to me close now. This is my first and last time in my entire life I have ever seen a real life gun. It's incredibly hard to get a firearm in New Zealand, especially after the regulations following the shooting in Christchurch. And not only that, he had one pistol on his belt and was waving another one about in his hand while he was talking to my boyfriend about wanting to kill some fish. He was aiming it down the creek every now and then and again and then swinging it around on his finger. My boyfriend gave me the stern look and... Stern is the best word for it because the look spoke a million things to me in the moment and he nodded his head towards the gravel hill leading back to the track. I grabbed the two bags that we had, fake checked my phone and told the man that our family were waiting for us back at the car park. He completely ignored what I had said and instead responded, That's a cool hat you got Don. Or something about my hat that was completely irrelevant so I just dismissed it myself and said goodbye and made my way to the hill. In my mind, I did not want to look back and see my boyfriend being shot and then a gun at my head. I knew that our best bet was me getting up this hill on that narrow path that he couldn't ride his quad down and just sprinting to the farmhouses. As I'm walking up the hill, this guy says to my boyfriend, That's a really pretty girl you got there. It was like all the intentions of his I didn't want to believe were confirmed and I felt like I would die. My boyfriend, though, said a quick thank you, we'll be off now, and headed up the hill with me. 
The guy kept talking on like the conversation hadn't even ended as we headed away and he stood there, gun in hand, watching us leave. As soon as we were around the corner, we sprinted all the way back to the car park where we hadn't noticed before. There were over 10 empty gun shells. Bullet shells? I'm not sure. I don't even know, but empty used bullets. We had run into two girls in bikinis just arriving at the spot as we did and informed them about everything. They got in their cars and left immediately. We tried to go to the farmer's house to ask if he knew the guy as we had never seen him on the land before, but they weren't home. As for the gun, it's still so freaky to me that I had never seen one before. But these pistols look quite old and rusty, and when we discussed the incident on the way home, my boyfriend suggested that they were probably handed down to him from someone else. This incident has stuck with me for the past few years, and my boyfriend and I have not been able to return to that spot, which sucks because that's where we had our first date and it was a really sentimental place for us. I had to drive past the road leading to the truck for like a year as I commuted between towns and it always made me feel sick. I could have lost my life or my partner that day or so much worse and I'm always extremely grateful that my boyfriend is the man that he is and was able to steer this crazy guy away from us for us to leave and to communicate to me through movement to tell me what to do in my freaked out state. He told me after that that he was ready to die if he had to because knowing the guy had been watching us beforehand and complimented me in a way that he did, it was clear that he could have had some very scary intentions. The events here took place when I was an 11 year old girl on vacation with my family. My mother, younger brother and I went down to Port Elizabeth to visit family. Being the only kids present meant that we were more excited to play in the ocean than spend time indoors. My mom picked a sunny day, we packed our boogie boards and we headed to the nearest beach with my grandma tagging along. My brother and I ran towards a set of stairs leading down to the beach. I stopped. There were eyes on me. I just sensed it. Growing up in South Africa, you were taught to be vigilant. Notice your surroundings. Notice people especially. I looked around the crowd trying to pinpoint what was setting my radar off. And then I found it. Two men about 20 meters in front of me, about late 20s to early 30s. They were frozen in place, staring at me with big, toothy smiles on their face. I returned a smile and a nod, acknowledging their presence but also making them aware that I saw them. Be friendly, not naive. Be polite. Don't trust. Observing them, I felt unsettled. The crowd was moving around them. They didn't speak to one another and they only seemed to move as I glanced away. I was alarmed but only made a mental note to keep an eye on them, continued down the stairs and jumped into the soft sand. My brother and I waited for the adults to pick a spot to set up before we took off swimming. Some time went by. I saw the same men from earlier wade into the water quite some distance from us and felt a bit silly for still worrying about them. But I just couldn't shake that uneasiness. I got out and took a rest by my mom. I didn't see the men anywhere but the feeling of having eyes on me stayed. I chalked it up to paranoia and went back to the water after a few minutes. My brother had gotten out of the water and started digging his magnificent sand pit, so I decided to use him as a landmark to determine my position in the water while riding the waves out. I did this a few times. Suddenly, goosebumps shot up my back. I looked around and the same men were just a few meters away from me, waving and beckoning me towards them. I was having fun until then and hadn't noticed them approaching. Adrenaline set in as I saw them smiling once more and their eyes seemed blank, insincere and out of place with those huge grins. I nervously grinned back and just shook my head at their invitation to come closer. I'm sure the fear was well written all over my face though, and as if to confirm my fears of their intentions, they started towards me. I knew I wouldn't be strong enough in the water to fight or run or swim and nobody was close enough to hear me call out. As I was panicking, the water suddenly pulled me deeper into the sea and a huge wave was coming. I placed my boogie board in position and started paddling. I was now further into the ocean than the creeps. The wave hit when they were about a meter away. 
and it took me right past them. I felt relieved for a split second, but then I felt a hand grabbing and yanking my ankle hard. My heart caught in my throat. I kicked out of instinct. Fortunately, being sunscreen doused, I was slippery and managed to get free instantly. The wave carried me all the way to the beach. I was coughing with a mouth full of seawater, but scampered to my feet and ran to fetch my brother. I told him I'd race him back to mom, and he was delighted for the challenge. I glanced back from where the sea had just ejected me. The creeps were still standing where they were, still smiling and still beckoning me towards them. I stayed at my mom's side until we finally packed up to head home. As we walked to our car, I looked over my shoulder and there they were. Two grown men, just staring and waving at a child that they had tried to grab like nothing was weird. And then they just turned around and disappeared into the crowd. This happened back in early 2015. I was then a 19-year-old guy living in a rather bad area of Portland, Oregon. Even though there was occasionally some belligerent homeless people and drug addicts, violent muggings very rare and most of the city felt very safe even at night. One of my best friends turned 21 and we decided to go bar hopping and then go clubbing. I was in a group of about a dozen other people and three of which were my roommates. Unfortunately for me, I was the only one in my group who was either under the legal age of drinking or did not have a fake ID card. This meant that I was unable to enter the bar. However, to my luck, there was a nice Mediterranean restaurant across the street from the bar which I ended up going to. I stayed there for more than an hour and then I was ready to leave. I've done that walk many times, even at night, so I was never scared. Until this night, of course and from my apartment, my roommates took an Uber to the bar. This meant that I would have to walk back since I didn't have an Uber and my phone battery was running low. The distance back to my apartment was about three miles. The time was already close to midnight and I would be reaching my apartment at around 1 a.m. I decided to walk the distance anyway since I haven't been at the gym and thought that this would be a good exercise for the day. I began my walk and passed by lots of drunks. Even though some of the drunks would shout things at me, I never felt unsafe or threatened by them, so I was okay. However, the last mile to my apartment was through a darkly lit park that can be scary at night, not because of any crime, but because there is only one street light in that stretch of road. I reached this somewhat creepy area at around 12.30. As I descent down the dark and narrow street, I notice a black Chevy Silverado speed past me and slow down once he passes me. The truck almost comes to a stop, but then decides to drive ahead. I begin to shrug it off at first. However, this is where things really start to get creepy. After I walk nearly a quarter mile forwards, the Chevy Silverado comes down the opposite direction and does the same thing. When the truck slows down and almost comes to a halt, I begin to panic, but not openly show it. I pretend to ignore the vehicle, but my instincts tell me something is not right. The truck then starts to proceed, but this time, I can't keep calm. I was not in the middle of a dark and isolated park with no street lights, and there is likely not to be a single person in sight. After I walk about 500 more feet, I begin to look in horror as the same pickup truck comes flying towards me and puts a sudden brake about 100 feet behind me. One man, at around twice my age and bald, opens the passenger door and comes out of his truck carrying what looked like a hockey club. I look behind and lock eye contact with him. He gives me the most haunting and a sinister look I've ever seen from a real person. He begins to yell, screaming for me to get out of his sight or he'll mess me up. And then he says something I don't quite recognize. Now I'm of Indian origin and I have darker skin but I'm pretty sure what he said was a racial slur directed towards Muslims. As I was planning my escape, I remember how there was a wooded area between the park and my apartment. Where I was can cut across the park and go through some woods, then right across the woods was my apartment. This was smart because I was taking that shortcut during the day and the truck will not be able to cut through the woods. Just as I ran towards those woods, I heard another yelling in the distance, saying, F off and 
I heard this from another large guy walking in the opposite direction of the sidewalk I was on. I then see another large man walking his German Shepherd towards me. After that, the truck driver then started running at us with his hockey club and I just booked it. I dart towards the woods. Fortunately, the truck driver decides not to chase us and gets back in his truck. I reach my apartment five minutes later. At the parking lot of the apartment, I happened to see the guy walking his dog. He looked like a roughed up bodybuilder type, so I was also a little afraid of him too. However, we had a pleasant conversation. I begin to head up to my apartment and look at my apartment window, and to my disgust and horror, I see that black Chevy Silverado drive by my apartment and then leave. My friends came home close to 3 in the morning and just after I went to bed that night. Thankfully, I never saw that creep again and I moved out of that apartment a few months later. After this incident, I avoid walking alone in dark spots and isolated areas at night. It's just not worth it. So someone was following me home yesterday, and now I don't want to leave the house. I'm a 15-year-old female and I was walking home from the store yesterday, and I saw a black box car drive past me extremely slow and the man in the car was clearly watching me. And when he fully passed me, I saw him watching me in his rearview mirror. I thought it was weird and slowed down my pace so that I could tell if he was waiting for me or just a slow driver. He was still driving extremely slow but moved a little when he saw two guys riding past on bikes. He then moved to the edge of the short street that we were on and waited there. I was still towards the beginning of the street so I acted like I forgot something and I turned around to get out of his sight. I waited and kind of peeked out to see if he had left and when I saw that he was gone I continued walking. I didn't think it would happen but I made a mental note that if I saw the car behind me it meant that he circled back around. After I continued walking I made three turns and was three turns away from my house. When I was walking up a little hill and almost at the fourth turn, I looked back and saw that the man at the corner that I had just turned from, letting me know that he'd circle back around to find me. He sat there watching me continue walking until I got up the little hill and turned the corner. Then as I had just barely made the last turn and was close to my house, I saw the man's car just turn the corner of the street straight across from the way I was walking, waiting there. I pulled out my phone to call my mom and walked the other way and he left soon after I pulled out my phone. My mom came out and walked with me back to the house and I didn't see the car for the rest of the day, but I kept thinking, he knows what neighborhood I stay in, what if he comes back, what if the next time he comes back I'm out by myself again, what if no one's home to call, what if he sees me leaving and comes back when I'm the only one home. I'm so scared that he's going to come back that I don't want to go outside. I don't want to show him where I live, especially because I'm home alone very often. I have summer school and I have to go, but I don't want to leave the house in fear that he might be waiting for me, and I'm constantly looking out the windows to see if I can spot him, especially since if he was at the store that I was at, he definitely stays somewhere near that neighborhood. First, I know better than to meet people in their homes, so yes, this was stupid of me. I acknowledged that I acted in an unsafe way for my own well-being. I had posted this somewhere else, but it got removed, but let me get to the story. I met B on a dating app. He's been awkward to talk to, but we have stuck to texting, so I thought maybe it was just nerves, and the form of communication. We have similar interests, so I kept the conversation going. He messaged me the other day asking if I wanted to come watch the new season of The Witcher. I hesitated and asked if he was inviting me to his place and he said yes. He also quickly added that his female roommate was home or else he would not have asked. I decided to go. Stupid, I know. I entered the apartment and he's the only person there. I sat down on the other side of the room from him and he got up and came to sit beside me. He turned on the show and the next thing I know... He has his pants down, and he's asking me to sit on his lap. I'm not on birth control as I just got divorced and I'm currently waiting for a doctor's appointment, and he was aware of that as we have discussed kids and pregnancy abilities because 
I have teens and he has no kids and wants one. So not only did this guy think that I was just going to get intimate with him first meet up, he was cool if we got pregnant apparently. I stood up and just went to leave and he says something like, wait. I look back and he actually asked me if maybe I would just use my hand. I was just so shocked that I left and told him good luck. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night, the night before. So, if you got a story to submit, you can submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Letry podcast, where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, we got Cheddar Bay Biscuits just for you. <laughs>